there, I'm Zara Danejo, and this is Roundup. Today is part two of our discussion on surviving sickle cell disease with Samira Haruna Sanusi, an author, a survivor, and recently a mother who had a long struggle spanning several years fighting sickle cell disease. Welcome back to Roundup, Samira. Thank you so much, Zara. So tell me about the bone marrow transplant, the surgery itself. So um, the procedure of bone marrow transplant is uh, it's slightly different than other transplants. Like, for example, um, a, ki a kidney or liver transplant where the patient itself has to be opened up and the organ has to be transplanted. In the case of um, bone marrow transplant, the patient does not really go under the knife. Oh. Yes, uh. because um, the organ they need is the bone marrow. So what they do is um, your bone marrow is usually located in your waist or your elbow. I don't know why I thought the bone marrow was in my knee. No. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was like in my knee. So it's in your waist? Yeah, for adults it's usually in their waist. Wow. And for kids usually on their elbows. And it's not an organ like a heart or kidney or liver, so to speak. It's more like um, blood. So where this moon marrow is located is um, basically the factory that creates your blood cells and um, directs it to all parts of your body. Mm -hmm. So the bone marrow is harvested by just inserting a really long needle <laughs> into the waist of the donor and extracting it. So it's kind of like a blood um, donation hmm. but taking place on the waist. Mm -hmm. So all they do is push in that needle and just extra extract the blood and the cells mm -hmm. into a bag and then they prepare it in the lab mm -hmm. and then give the patient intravenously. So even the patient does not get caught or anything. Are you under general anesthetic or you're awake? For the donor? For the donee, for, for... Yeah, for the donor yeah. will be under general anesthesia. But when you're receiving it, are you going to be asleep? No. I was doing my exercises while I was getting my bone marrow. It's not painful? Not really. No, ah. the process is not painful at all. But you know your own threshold for pain is different no, from normal it was people. it's not painful at all because you get it, the way you get a bone mm. marrow transplant is the same way you get a blood donation. Right. So you just get it intravenously and, and then you can see it here. It's just blood. But it looks more fake. Mm -hmm. It looks more, um, I don't know, the texture is different. Mm -hmm. And then it's in a larger quantity mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just get it intravenously and that's all. Mm -hmm. Now, the other um, uh, treatments and processes surrounding the bone marrow transplant yeah. um, are what maybe sometimes cause pain, complications, rejection. Because remember, before the transplant, you have to do at least a week of chemotherapy first to make sure that your immune system is down and to prepare your body to receive the donor cells so that your body does not reject. And you know complications of chemotherapy can include um, sores, fatigue, painful bones and joints, muscles, and um, general weakness, mm -hmm. loss of hair, loss of appetite, and mm -hmm. the rest, yeah. And then um, during the transplant as well, and even after the transplant, you get more treatments like um, anti-rejection medication, which sometimes cause joint pains, as well as other treatments that um, they create a lot of discomfort, some pain, fatigue, weakness, you know, stuff like that. But there's no pain like um, the pain you feel if you were actually cut open. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in your book, S is for Survival, you talk a lot about how your brother Mustafa is your hero because he donated, he was your donor for, yes. for the transplant. Yes. How did Mustafa become your donor? So Mustafa became my donor because um, when you're doing, when you're undergoing a bone marrow transplant, what the experts do is first to suggest you look for a sibling donor because mm. the chances of um, survival and success are higher if the person donating is a sibling. Yeah. So um, usually parents are encouraged to just look within siblings and see if any of the siblings match, and then you can go ahead with the transplant. Of course, if you don't have any siblings or you don't have any matching siblings, um, the hospital can help you look through bone marrow registries 
available in other countries. Other countries have this option. So um, naturally, my siblings were the first to be tested. Now, Mustafa was um, the maybe only pick because he's the sibling I have from the same mom and dad, which is um, key for the success of the procedure. And then he's the only sibling I have who is AA from the same mom and dad. Wow. Yes. Wow. So, um, but the weird thing is we were really lucky that we matched because the chances of you having a sibling who matches with you is just 30%. 30%? 30 percent. 30 percent, yes. So you can have a sibling from the same mom and dad who is AA, who is totally healthy, maybe you even share the same um, blood group, but there's something that has to be tested called the HLA type and the chances of you having the same match with that sibling is just 30 percent so i was really lucky that um he wow. was a match wow yes wow wow so he's your hero and he, he is my hero <laughs> he was he was very young when he donated i don't even think he really understood the magnitude mm. of the sacrifice he was making yes or that he really understood that he was saving my life but it has brought us so much closer. Yeah. I appreciate him. I hold him in high regards. Yeah. Yeah. So what was recovery like? Is there anything like recovery after you received the transplant? Yes, so the recovery is pretty much um, most of the process. Right. Because the transplant, um, receiving the blood cells can be done in a day or two. And after that, it's just a waiting game. Usually the waiting period is 100 days where every day your blood blood has to be tested and then you continue to get um, chemotherapy in small dosages, you continue to get anti-rejection medication, they continue to uh, monitor you and you have to stay in what is called an isolation room in a hospital. This is a sterilized room where even the air that goes in and out is Sterilized. Yes, because I remember you talk about not seeing the sun for so long. Yes. Is that what happened? Yes, that's what happened because you're not allowed to go out, you know, because your immune system is compromised. So you literally cannot afford to even leave the room you are in, not to talk of go out into the world. And um, visitors or medical staff coming into the room also have to scrub in. So it was literally um, this process we're doing now because of COVID, you have to wash your hands with soap and water and then sanitize and then you wear a mask, you wear um, that cap thing they give mm -hmm. you in the hospital and then you wear a gown, mm -hmm. a hospital gown, you wear um, Crocs before you can enter into the room of a patient receiving um, bone marrow. So you were basically isolating way yes. ahead of us. <laughs> yes, and this yeah. is why when COVID started, I was very triggered because yeah. the first time after after it will take you back. Yes, when I wore the when COVID started and I wore a mask, I thought it smelled like one of the medication of my chemotherapy. Wow! I didn't know that it was just generally how how yeah. masks yeah smelled, yeah. and I remember already crying about it. I'm like, I I can't do this. This COVID has to leave immediately. Mm. I don't think I can handle mask and all of this. Mess. It was really triggering. But eventually, yeah, I got used to it. So what do you do when you're in that isolation room? What do you do? So pretty much watch TV. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. <laughs> you watch TV. You, um, I, I used to, that was when I became really good friends with so many people online. Yeah. <laughs> because I didn't really have friends in Austria and um, you can't really get a lot of visitors. So mostly the only visitors I had was my mom and dad. So you had like plenty Wi-Fi? Yes, unlimited <laughs> Wi-Fi. Yeah, so unlimited you're always wifi. online. I was always <laughs> online, always. And at the same time, also, I became friends with other patients who were going through um, bone marrow transplant at the same time as well in the hospital. But unfortunately, we could not meet. Mm -hmm. So what we used to do was um, I had this friend who have, her room was facing mine. And then there's a door and it has like a screen on it. Mm -hmm. So she will remove the blinds from her screen and I'll remove the one from mine and then we'll chat online. So just to see a human, another human being's face? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Because you can't really have um, physical yeah. touch and contact. Yeah. yeah. And even when you do, um, the person is protected, wearing gloves, mm -hmm. mask and everything like that. There's no humanity at all? No. Wow. Not really. So what were some of the significant changes Well, the first after the surgery for the you? The first thing was not having crisis anymore 
and I remember... You sound quite happy about that. Yes. Oh, my God, you have no idea. Crises are the worst. They are the worst. I feel like whatever you do, spare your kids from that pain and agony. Because even people like us who have gone through it, we still haven't found the right words to explain the depth of the pain. My God. And the, the struggle. So for me, just being relieved of those crises was enough. It, it, was, it was everything. I remember waking up one day, two day, day three, day four, day five, not having any pain. And for the first time, I felt like something is off. It, was, it felt like a part of me had been taken away. I felt really weird. I was not used to waking up without pain. <laughs> I was used to waking up in the morning, sitting up in bed, shaking maybe my leg or arm to <laughs> to know which part of the body is aching for the day and then knowing how to maneuver and navigate throughout the day. But after the transplant, I'll wake up, stand up, nothing is paining me, nothing is weird. And it just felt like I had lost a part mm -hmm. of me, mm -hmm. but in a good way, mm -hmm. in a good way, yeah. And so many of the other changes as well, a lot of my organs that had previously been affected were starting to heal on their own. Wow. Um, yes. Wow. Yes. And um, I just started to generally, yeah. you know, recover as the days went by. Yeah. yeah. You also lost your mobility. Yes, I did. Talk us through that. So losing the mobility was actually the very first um, effect I had when the illness started. Like I said, July 1st, 2003 was the first time that I walked on my own. After that, um, I was actually bedridden for several months. And um, to even get me to change a position, you have to first sedate me and then get nurses who oh hold God. me and then turn me in bed. And that's how. So any, I couldn't be propped up. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk again. Mm -hmm. And um, as the issue started to progress, the chances of me ever being able to walk again even grew slimmer. Because even when, even after the transplant was successful, doctors were still not sure that I was going to be able to walk again because the damage had been so bad. My bone density had really been destroyed. My hip joints and everything. I had osteoporosis. I had septic art arthritis. And um, my bones were literally so thin, even my muscles. I used to call, at the time, I used to call my legs hockey sticks because that's what they looked like. You'll see in the picture of mm -hmm. me sitting on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. They literally looked like toothpicks or hockey sticks. So doctors were not even sure how to start. Fixing that. Yes, yeah. how to start operating on a leg mm -hmm. that already looks that fragile on bones that once you touch them, they will, yeah, disperse. Yeah. So, but um, eventually... I started doing physiotherapy exercises while on the bed to gain some muscle mass and to mobilize my joints because a lot of them from not moving had already stuck in place. So I remember my left knee was stuck in this angle and I could not extend it at all or anything. Mm -hmm. So every morning the physiotherapy will include mm -hmm. just doing this mm -hmm. and uh, maybe 10 to 15 times and then do it again in the afternoon till e eventually it straightened mm -hmm. here. And then I also had a lot of um, orthopedic. Eventually, I started to have orthopedic surgeries that will correct some of the Damage, deformities yeah. Yeah, and damages that had happened. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of, I think out of the, I've had a total of 31 surgeries so far. And out 31, of 31, can you please say that again? Yeah. You said you have had 31 Is surgeries. Is it 31 or 33, Seth? 33? No, it's 31. Yes. It's definitely 31. Okay, because you've this had a baby one, yes. also. So this yeah. last one is the 31st. So you've had 31 surgeries. Yes. And majority of them were all orthopedic in order to heal my bones and um, get me to walk again. And alhamdulillah, it worked. So I, I'm saying, I, I can safely say that surgery doesn't scare you. Not anymore. <laughs> hey, hi, old friend. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yeah, yes. That's, that's I, amazing. I've had so many of them. 
I don't like the recovery process though. Yeah. I like the surgery part because once it's done, it's, it's over, done. you're good. Yeah. But then when you remember that you now have to start getting out of bed, exercising, waiting for the pain to go away. Yeah, but like, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, with all the painkillers involved in managing sickle cell disease, you know, it's like really common to see survivors and patients have an addiction to painkillers. Did mm -hmm. you struggle with that? Um, yes, I did in the beginning because when I was sick in Nigeria, the only pain management um, technique they had was to give painkillers and I, I think it's still the same up till now. So if you're in pain, painkillers. If you're in pain, painkillers. Other strategies are not really um, explored here. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to Austria, I had um, developed this, I guess, addiction, you call it, where once the pain starts, I want it to be taken care of there and then. Mm -hmm. I don't have the patience to wait for it to maybe subside on its own mm -hmm. or maybe just um, in other countries, they can try to distract you to get you to forget about the pain, get some relief or even sleep. So I didn't have that the patience at all for that. I'm like, what what kind of talk is this? Distract give me, me. my painkillers. Exactly. <laughs> give me the morphine now. Give me the morphine. Yeah, I didn't have time to just, I didn't have the patience to mm -hmm. cry it out or get massage or mm -hmm. get a hot bath mm -hmm. or get a hot water bottle mm -hmm. or cold compress. Mm -hmm. Nah, I, I just wanted the pain to be taken care yeah. of then. And then um, I also struggled with sleeping without the pain medication because as, as it calms you down and it, it takes care of the pain, you're finally able to get some relief and sleep for hours where you don't have to worry about the pain again mm -hmm. because you're sleeping. You don't have to worry about any loneliness, any mm -hmm. ill feelings. You don't have to worry about the situation that you're in. I didn't even have to worry about being away from my parents or being away from home or being stuck in a hospital for months. Mm -hmm. Because once I get that pain relief, I'm able to sleep and sleep became my ex, um, mm -hmm. escape from mm -hmm. everything that I was going through. So without warning, they just started to win me off all the pain medications and I'm like, you can't we did not discuss this at all. <laughs> I remember <laughs> arguing with the doctors and they're like, no, we need to try other pain management techniques. I'm like, nope, that's not how they used to do it. I called my dad all the way in Nigeria and I'm like, talk to these people because they're moving You mad. are genuinely upset at this yes, point. Yes, I was. I was. I, I, I called him in Nigeria and I was like, talk to these people. <laughs> and he said, okay, give the doctor the phone. He spoke to her. She made him understand. They talked for ages. I thought him being who he is and a strong advocate for his children's health you know this is a person who will fight doctors if they tell him his daughter is not going to survive yeah. or walk yeah. again so i thought there's no way he won't be able to convince her yeah. at the end of their phone call i'll surely have my painkillers they talked and talked and talked and talked and then she gave me back the phone and i was like hello daddy and he's like talk <laughs> it's for the best. It's for the You've best. You've been dependent on the painkillers for too long. They're not good for your liver, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh my God. You betrayed me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> and that's when I knew that, okay, it really is not happening yeah. because if he's the kind of person that if he can get you something, he'll he get it. He will you. get it. Yeah. Yeah. So for him to say, just let it go yeah. and do it their way, then I knew that there was nothing left to be done. Yeah. But I survived so, it. Away yeah. from all the, we've talked about injections so much, I'm worried now. <laughs> <laughs> you came back to Nigeria mm -hmm. and, you know, another person would have come back, oh my God, I don't have sickle cell anymore, and you would have just moved on with your life. But no, you decided to roll up your sleeves and then start advocacy work, mm -hmm. which eventually led to the formation of your foundation, the mm -hmm. Samira Sanusi Sickle Cell Foundation. Yes. Why did you want to work with people who were like you? Why didn't you just want to move on from all the pain and the mm -hmm. trauma and, you know, like try and have a normal life? Why did you decide to become an advocate? Actually, the plan was to move on. Because after everything that I had been through, by the time I moved back to Nigeria, I had gone through at least 20-something surgeries at mm. that time. I had gone through um, being on a wheelchair for six years, mm -hmm. um, a lot of physiotherapy. Yeah. So when I came back, um, the plan was to move on. But then I realized that so many people were struggling, Zara. 
so many people who did not have access to going to Saudi Arabia or Austria or bone marrow transplant or even good painkillers were struggling and there was no one speaking up for them. There were no funds being raised for them. There was no one advocating for better health care and management and treatment for them. And Nigeria being one of the countries that has the highest number of sickle cell patients in the world, I felt like people deserve more. We deserved more. Mm -hmm. Even when I was living with the illness, I, knew, I, I, I barely knew much about it. As a sickle cell patient, I didn't even know my genotype. I didn't know much about the illness that I was fighting. And so many people just did not know. So I felt like after everything that had been through, this was the perfect way to give back. Mm -hmm. And this was the perfect way to show my gratitude to God. Mm -hmm. So away from all the medical drama that happened, how did you find love? You recently got married and it seemed like such a big dream come true for you. How did you find love? I think love found me because I can't tell you I found love. I mean, I went looking for it, <laughs> sometimes in the wrong places, sometimes in the wrong people. And being someone who lives with a chronic illness or with um, a disability or with a lot of health baggage, it's not easy to find someone who will accept you exactly the way you are. It's not easy to find someone who will accommodate you instead of tolerating you. And even when you do, a sad person has families who will be like, nah, my son is not going to marry someone who is sick, who will exhaust his pockets with paying medical bills or who will not be able to be a good wife because she has issues she's taking care of. So um, I like to believe that love found me. It was something that I prayed for and Alhamdulillah I received. And in the process, there have been many relationships where at the end of them, I felt like, okay, maybe I do not deserve love maybe i was wrong to think that um i too was deserving or that i was normal enough to deserve it because it was a series of being with so many people who will say yeah i love you but no i don't think i can settle down with you i love you but i cannot make a commitment to loving you exactly because you just have a lot going on and i'm well uh, and i'm like well everyone has a lot going on and um, at least you know what my issues are. They are out in the open. They are pretty self-descriptive. Um, but um, life is also unpredictable. You're sitting here normal, mm -hmm. but that can change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And how are you going to feel when your life flips mm -hmm. tomorrow and mm -hmm. suddenly the special people in your life decide that they're not doing it again? Yeah. But what was special about your husband? Why, how did he become your husband? I think the one thing that was special about him was with him, I never for once felt that I was not 100% normal. I never felt that I was not okay. I never felt that I was disabled or I was sick. You know, with That's other beautiful. people, yeah. There are people who will admit that here yeah, you have an issue and okay I can accept you and then you know with the kind of issues and experiences I've had sometimes there are self-doubts sometimes there are self-image issues there are confidence issues and there are a lot of um, whisperings in your ears or thoughts going through your mind with him he calmed those thoughts he addressed those fears he reassured me over and over again and he still does mm -hmm. and he's just one person that I know that he loves me for the sake of Allah, that yeah, he does see everything I have or don't have, and he's still staying. Yeah. And um, being with him while we're dating, I never for once questioned his um, commitment to me or, and there were even times when I will tell him, you know, I have this problem, right? And um, other times I'll be like, did I tell you about this certain complication? Because I just wanted to list out every single red flag wrong. about me. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that um, he won't run in the end. 
or so that if he's deciding to stay with me, then he's making an informed decision. <laughs> so <laughs> you say an informed decision, like yes, it's a contract. so that he will. Uh, it, it, it is yeah. a contract. Yeah. Marriage is a contract, and be with someone who is as maybe dynamic as I am. It is a contract. You have to be intentional about it. Because you can't come halfway and say, oh, you have mm. too many problems. You yeah. knew that from the start. Yeah. But what would you say to um, sickle cell patients who constantly complain? You know, they say nobody wants to love us. Nobody wants to have relationships with us. Nobody wants to marry us. I think um, I wish I had a formula or I wish I could say this is how I found love and you'll find it too, but I cannot because people are different and people can be mean. Mm. People can forget that destiny happens, that accidents happen, that illnesses happen, that life happens. So there's no easy way for me to say that, oh, don't worry about it, you definitely mm -hmm. find someone for you, there's mm -hmm. no way. I think what I will say instead is to people who do, not, who do not have these issues, that you have to learn to be more accommodating. You have to remember that life can happen to anyone. You have to remember that people who are going through things did not choose to go through exactly. these things. You have to learn how to be kind, how to be less judgmental, how to meet people with open arms, how to see people beyond just their illness and their differences or their disability. You had a swell like two, three years. You've been on a high. You just had your son. Yes. How has motherhood been? Oh, it has been amazing so far. It has been amazing. And um, I can't even describe it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you ever think that you would be a mother? I always knew I'll be a mom. Funny enough, because so many people did not think that I'll ever mm -hmm. be able to have kids or be a mom. And it was also one of the um, red flags in relationships for me where um, boyfriends mm -hmm. or their families are like, are you sure this one can even have a child? Are well, they sure? say that to you at the dating stage, like you're a reproductive cow. Yes, yes. They're oh actually like, are you sure she can have kids for you? <laughs> yeah, so many people were, were, were doubtful and I was just so shocked because it never bothered me for a minute. I, I, I knew that it was possible that I could do it yeah. and alhamdulillah it happened here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking us through your journey of survival and um, we hope your story inspires other people to maybe seek out other treatments that um, may make them survivors. Inshallah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for us. having me again. It's no secret that we are in political season. So everywhere is rife with political campaigns, one conspiracy theory or another. So much noise around 2023, 2023. But you know what you can do to clear out the noise? Especially if you've never voted before. 2023 could mean something very, very significant a significant change in our nation's history. And the only way you can participate in that history is to register as a voter. There are several PVC registration points around Abuja and other states. Please make sure that you register and collect your PVC so that you can participate in uh, 2023 elections. The 2023 elections are going to be elections like we have never had before. So make sure that you play your part. As we speak, the PVC registration is ongoing at the old parade ground in Gerki. So you can just stop by. And I've heard that they've streamlined the process so you don't have to wait for hours to get your PVC. I'm Zara Denejo, and this has been Roundup. I'll see you next week. <laughs>